I'm a climate economist. There's a bunch of us, certainly not the only one. And a few of us like to tell sort of a story when we introduce ourselves as a climate economist. You sort of met with this blank stare. Can't possibly be the case that you do both of these things. Right? So you're either an environmentalist, you recycle, you care about the planet, you feel bad about boarding a flight, or you're an economist. You worry about interest rates, jobs, the economy. You can't possibly do both. And yes, that economics, misguided economics, market forces pointing in the wrong direction, are the reason we're in this mess in the first place. While it's also economics, guided, guiding market forces in the right direction, that are the only hope, frankly, to get us out of it. Now, rest assured, I will not be discussing the basic science here, right? Temperatures are rising, emissions are rising. We are the reason for both of these. But what I will do is make three points, trying to tease out the, what I think are the most crucial aspects of economics when applied to climate, climate policy. Point one, Yes, there's plenty of things we do know, and what we do know should have led us to act a long time ago, frankly. But really, it's what we don't know. What Don Rumsfeld would call the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns, the risks and uncertainties that are truly costly. Point two, it's a bit of a confession actually, but sort of economists have had this solution for a long time. Now, unfortunately, they, we, call it a tax. Tax, of course, is a four-letter word, and not just in Washington. Um, now, we don't really mean that when we say a tax. We mean many, many more things that fall under this. Or at least a more enlightened version means much, much more than just saying, let's tax CO2 and get out of the way. And then point three, if we, uh, take this economic logic to its logical conclusion, it is not a question of if, it's a question of when. Will pursuing solar geoengineering, solar radiation management, lots of names for that, but something, frankly, some truly scary things that when, once one takes the economics seriously are not if. Okay, point one. perhaps the most important set of numbers that defines life on this planet going forward as we know it. Uh, usually in this country I would translate this into Fahrenheit. This is in a very educated audience, so let's stick to centigrade here. Uh, 1.5 to 4.5 degrees centigrade is what happens to global average temperatures eventually as concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere double. This is called climate sensitivity, has this very tight definition. And yes, there is this range. We don't know for sure what the right number is, but it doesn't include zero. We know adding CO2 isn't going to decrease temperatures. That we know. But this range is in fact huge. We've already passed one degree centigrade of global average warming. I, there are these political goals out there, one and a half, two degrees. Getting there, exceeding that would already be bad enough. The problem is we don't know whether we will get there, whether we will be able to limit emissions to that, even if we pull out all the stops. Now here's where this risk and uncertainty question comes in. This number has been with us for a while. Jewel Chani, 1979, National Academy um, study. There were two studies available at the time. One's at two degrees, the other one's at four degrees, at half a degree, because why not? Uncertainty, and that was the range. Now, fast forward. IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, dozens, hundreds of climate scientists coming together trying to make sense of this. 
still the same range. 1992, 1995, 2001, not for a lack of trying. Right? Hundreds, thousands of studies. Yes, the most important connection between CO2 up there and global average temperatures eventually. By now, we have a better idea of what this range is. It's the likely range. There's a tight definition for that. It's 66% probability to be within this range, not two thirds, not 67. Don't ask why. 66% probability of being in that range. 2007. Good news, bad news. All right, good news. We've tightened the range. Bad news. We did it the wrong way. Increased the lower bound. Looks like lower temperature increases are out. The likely range now, the best science says, is two to four and a half degrees. Enormous uncertainty here. That was 2007, the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Fast forward to the fifth assessment report, 2013. We're back to where we were in 1979. Now, turns out both things I said before, the good news and bad news, was wrong. It's not good news that we narrowed the range, it's just news. There's new science coming in. That was the best we could do, 2007. Now, five years later, turns out that likely range is once again wider. Apparently there is more risk, more uncertainty here than we, saw, we thought five years prior. Now, unfortunately, the other bit was wrong too. It's not necessarily bad news when we tighten the range, even if we do it by increasing the lower bound. This is the bad news, the widening of the range. Doesn't include zero. There are, in fact, climate changes built in here, but there is now bigger uncertainty, greater uncertainty of where we will actually be. And it's precisely this uncertainty, that risk, the not knowing, that is so costly. Now, just to assure you, yes, there's a lot of science behind this, a bunch of PDFs, not what Adobe gives us, but probability density functions. Uh, there's probabilities of where these temperatures are going. And yes, it's pretty likely we will be in this range. That's already bad enough, right? The two, three degrees of global average warming. The really problem is we can't cut off that tail. We can't be sure that global average temperatures don't rise even further. All right, so let's simplify once again. There's this likely range. But there's one additional problem here. We're still just talking about climate sensitivity here, this parameter. No one really cares about that necessarily. We care about where actual temperatures are going. So we need to go back to our models, make a bunch of assumptions. Basically, try to project where concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere are going in order to be able to say where temperatures are going. Well, let's just take this one prediction here. This one probability distribution. And look at one scenario, what the International Energy Agency calls the new policy scenario. That's already a pretty optimistic one. It already accounts for new policies coming down the line that are not currently on the books to try to see what that does. Well, and unfortunately, back to the risk and the uncertainty and how costly that is, we can't even exclude extreme scenarios like here, the six degrees centigrade of global average warming. Uh, Mark Linus, British Bill McKibben, environmental writer, uh, wrote this book called Six Degrees. He's British, so he gets away with centigrade here. Six chapters, one degree, two degree, three degrees, trying to detail what happens to life on Earth what science knows about life on Earth, degree by degree, centigrade of warming. The sixth chapter, six degrees, starts with Dante's Inferno, the sixth circle of hell. Now for a lack of trying, and of course there's some literary license here, but frankly, 
there's no mistaking this for a planetary catastrophe, planetary Charlie Foxtrot, if you will. And unfortunately, we can't even exclude that. Now, right, as an economist, back to the dollars and cents, the known knowns, what we can quantify, what we can measure, gets us to something around $40 per ton of CO2. Every ton we emit, the average American emits about 20 tons of CO2. Average European, 10. I'm a dual citizen, I get 30. Every one of these tons causes about these $40 worth of damages that we know of. Then there's this stuff. Now, I can't give you a precise answer. I can't tell you what the right number is. What I can say is that it is exactly those tails, the fat tails, that are truly costly, that the right price is in fact much, much higher. It's not over till the fat tail zings, it's the risks and uncertainties that are costly. Okay, now, what to do? Right? Global emissions are going up, up and up. This was sort of a good news period here, it was 2006. Global fossil CO2 emissions had been constant for about three years. Unfortunately, sorry, 2016. Um, 2017 emissions rose, 2018 highest ever. And unfortunately, it's not about stabilizing emissions. Right? It's about getting them down to zero. It's a very highly scientific graph here where they need to go, but actually it turns out it's actually pretty accurate. And you run these major models, they're all somewhere between 2040 and 2060, so sort of mid-century. We need to get down to zero. If we want to limit emissions to uh, temperature increases, even more so, like one and a half degrees centigrade, we'd have to do that even sooner. Right? That's the task, and it's a big one. Now, it turns out economists have an answer. We usually do for lots of things. Uh, it's a carbon tax. It's a price on CO2. Now, turns out we don't really mean that, or at least the enlightened version of us doesn't really mean that, literally a tax. It's lots and lots of things. It's the Green New Deal. It's sort of, it's all these things that fall under this, the things that need to happen. And yes, lots of things are in fact happening. There's some good news here too. The price of solar photovoltaic it's decreased by some 80, 85% the last seven, eight years. Price goes down, deployment goes up. Germany has done a lot, truly a lot, to subsidize the deployment of renewable energy on the demand side mostly, with these global effects. China, same thing on the supply side for the most part. Right, so you put these together, and frankly, our task is sort of to brush up on our German and Chinese, start writing thank you notes to German and Chinese households, thank them for subsidizing this stuff for the rest of us. Right? Economists would say what they are doing domestically is sort of inefficiently much, but of course there is global benefit here. California, another sort of success story. More has to happen, but yes, there is lots and lots of good news to go around too. Back to the big picture. Again, highly scientific graph here. Climate risk over time. Well, if you burn fossil fuels forever, climate risk keeps going up. No real news there. What if we cut emissions to zero? Turns out we limit that increase in climate risk. We do. That's the solution. We have to cut emissions to zero. But at least in our lifetimes, and those are time scales that matter, hundreds of years out, climate risk doesn't in fact go down. We limit the increase in temperatures, we limit the, the rise of sea levels, we don't get them down. For that, we need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, literally suck CO2 out of thin air. And even then, right, there's a lot of hurt built in here. There's this peak. And frankly, the big, big question, and once again, to the economics here, the big question is, what do we do? Is there something to be done? And where do the, those fundamental market forces point to? Right? Can we somehow shave this peak? And that's the specter of geoengineering. 
1991, Mount Pinatubo erupts in the Philippines. 1992, global average temperatures decrease by about half a degree centigrade. 1993, all this stuff in the stratosphere falls out again. About 18 months later, after the eruption, temperatures are back up and up to trend. But it's that principle, not very scientifically, but loosely speaking, throwing gunk into the stratosphere, that in fact makes the planet potentially more reflective and cools what's underneath. It's the same reason why we were white between uh, Memorial Day and Labor Day, and why winter jackets are black. And white reflects, black absorbs, makes you warmer in the winter. Well, brightening the planet, writ large, would do this. Now, that's the solar geoengineering here. Here's the real problem, if you will. Back to sort of economic jargon. Why are we in this mess in the first place? It's what we call the free rider problem. Right? There's seven billion of us, it's a billion high leaders, mostly responsible for the problem, guilty as charged. All of us here, part of those billion high emitters. And it's what economists call the free rider problem. It's in nobody's self-interest to be doing enough. Not that we even could, but we simply don't. We're all free riders here. Well, geoengineering, solar geoengineering, it's the exact opposite. It is so cheap, so powerful, to be doing this, to engage in this intervention, that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's not a matter of incentivizing people to do more of it. If anything, it's a question of stopping people from doing too much. So yes, it's the risks, the uncertainties, the stuff we don't know that is costly. <coughs> we have a solution. It's not the solution. <laughs> takes much, much more than just one single intervention. But yes, it's about getting emissions down, pricing emissions. And yes, if you, if one takes the economics seriously and brings them to their logical conclusion, it's not if, it's when we are looking at a world that also looks toward deploying solar geoengineering. Thank you very much.